It's time now for perspective. In the mid-20th century, some of the world's brightest scientific minds invented the atomic bomb, used, of course, to devastating effect at the end of the Second World War. And in large part due to the Cold War arms race, today there are thousands of nuclear warheads in existence. According to our guest today, it's now the job of a new generation of scientists to work out how best to manage this extremely challenging inheritance. Well, I'm joined on set now by Emlyn Hughes, Professor of Physics at Columbia University and the founding director of the K equals one project at the Center for Nuclear Studies. Thank you very much for speaking to us here today. Thank you very much for having me. Now, would you please start by explaining uh, the name uh, of this project, K equals one? What does that signify? Yeah. So K equals one has actually two meanings and it was named by students who were working with me on nuclear issues. And the K equals one constant is a, um, it's a mathematical constant that explains um, whether something is supercritical or undercritical, it's, 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 a, it's just a mathematical um, symbol to explain um, nuclear reactions. But it's also called the criticality constant. And when the young people chose to name our center at K equals one, they also felt that nuclear issues were a critical issue for their generation. And so they were play on this pun that is both a, a physics term, but it's also a, a critical term for our generation or for our world, in fact. A pun that did go over my head at first, I, I must yeah. admit. Yeah. Um, and what exactly are these uh, these yeah. pressing critical nuclear issues the, today? The issue is just the status of nuclear weapons um, in our world and the dangers. The rise in the number of nuclear weapon states over time is a big one. There are now nine nuclear weapon states, and in the early days, um, one was gaining a nuclear weapon state about once every five years. So the world just becomes a more dangerous place as more countries have nuclear weapons, and so that that's a critical issue. And um, just the lack of, for us at Columbia University, where I'm a professor, um, the lack of discussion about nuclear issues, especially among the young generation, we do see as a big problem. And why do you think it is that younger scientists aren't necessarily so yeah. keen to discuss nuclear? Yeah. By the way, it's not only, just a little correction, it's not only scientists. I'm working with students from all different fields. So um, the nuclear issue, is of course a science issue because of the technology, but it's also an issue on policy and politics and um, what, and, and even on nuclear energy, of course, is a big topic. Um, so I think that the, it, it is a critical issue because one has to get some control over this technology because it can be very dangerous, obviously. Um, we have, I'll digress a little bit, but we have spent the last five years working in the Marshall Islands where the U.S. did its nuclear weapons testing program. And we've made measurements of the contamination of these islands. And the impact, even though this wasn't overtly a war um, there, just the testing of these weapons were so dangerous and so impactful on people that this has become for us a very big issue. Um, and, and of course, if you ever do explode a nuclear bomb, again, like in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, or even worse, a hydrogen bomb, um, the impacts are catastrophic. And these sorts of impacts yeah. we're talking about, are these impacts that you think scientists in the 40s could have foreseen or not necessarily? Um, it was, tr well, yes, scientists foresaw them and many of the scientists were against it. Um, Robert Oppenheimer, who built the first um, atomic bomb, was against the construction of the hydrogen bomb, which is a thousand times more powerful than the bombs that blew up Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, but there was a Cold War on between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and there was an explosive growth in the number of weapons on both the Soviet Union side and the, and, and the U.S., and then, of course, other countries got into it quickly also. And do you think there is a real possibility that we could once again find ourselves in the position that we found ourselves in during the Cold War? Um, unfortunately, yes, because um, what's happening now, a little bit slowly but not that slowly, is previous arms agreements are now um, being ignored. Um, there was an arms agreement that Obama um, signed and, um, about 10 years ago, but that will run out in a year, and it's not at all clear that... Um, we don't know who the president will be a year from now, but if Donald Trump is still president, there's a very great worry that um, he will ignore that um, treaty and that once you start getting rid of arms control treaties, you'll be back into, you could imagine easily being back into an arms race. And that's 
terrible. And it's not just uh, the U.S. president; it's also Russia. It's also Russia. Um, it, it's both sides. But once one, you know, once there's a conflict um, and the the trees go away, there's no um, limit on what you can do in terms of building more nuclear weapons. And certainly, both countries are investing lots of money in their nuclear um, in in their nuclear technologies. And how do you get countries in this day and age to play by the rules when it comes to nuclear weapons? Or is it enough to rely yeah. on the doctrine of mutually assured destruction? No, I'm not. I'm not a. War? I'm not a big <laughs> um, proponent of mutually assured destru destruction as a way of stopping things. Um, look, in 2017, the ICAN um, group won the Nobel Prize for taking to the UN and having countries sign on to the banning of nuclear weapons, to just get rid of them entirely. Unfortunately, none of the nuclear weapon states sign on to that treaty, but it's being pushed forward. So I think the pushback is from the other countries and the, the community that um, are, you know, the world in general is against nuclear weapons. But there, there, are, there are great dangers. I'm, I'm even worried that we're going to return to a point where people won't admit that um, a nuclear war is not winnable. So these, these, these discussions are beginning to come back, and, and that's a dangerous situation today, clearly. So from nuclear weapons to nuclear energy, a lot of yeah. countries, France uh, among them, yes. do rely heavily on nuclear energy. Right. Is that a good thing, in your opinion? Um, so people have different views on this. I'm not a big pro-nuclear energy person. Um, I just went last November. I'm not sure this was smart, but I went to Chernobyl and um, toured the site because I've actually, our work was actually compared to Chernobyl in terms of contamination of the marsh lawns in Chernobyl. And um, look, I think it would be, I think with Chernobyl and Fukushima in Japan, there are clear dangers to the technologies. Um, some of them could be, you know, man-made mistakes that could go wrong. Some are not even man-made mistakes. So um, it's not necessarily the greatest technology. Now I'm sitting in Paris, so I'm well aware that I'll probably not even make it home after Take what I just said, Congress. right, because of 75 percent of the energy here is nuclear. But I think nuclear technology, um, there is a danger for France, which relies very heavily on this. I think what's most important is that um, people get educated on the topic, that the I'm a little worried here there's too much secrecy with the nuclear issue because it's so important to France because of its investment in energy. So. And then Hughes, professor yeah. of physics at Columbia University, also founding director of the K equals one project. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for having me. Our yep. pleasure. Right. A reminder now of our top headlines here on France 24. A night of bloodshed in the southwestern German city of Hanau after nine people are shot dead at two separate locations. Police say one suspect has been found dead at his home, along with another body. And U.S. billionaire Mike Bloomberg receives fire from all sides as the Democratic presidential hopeful takes part in his first TV debate. The former New York City mayor forced to defend his record on everything from race to gender equality.